good morning, Gateway Seminary. Welcome to our annual Dear Hester Lecture Series. Now, this was originally two different lecture series that were, were combined a number of years ago. I don't know how many, but they would focus alternatively on theology and preaching, uh, with particularly bringing in experts in either academic or, uh, academic or professional uh, ministry or experience. Uh, and then we bring in the experts in each year to, to minister to our student body, to our uh, academic community. So we're very happy to be gathered today uh, for this purpose. Dr. Stewart said he was going to be brief, and he meant it. All right. I'd like to welcome those of you who are here as well, and those of you who are viewing online and who will be viewing online later as you see the video of this event. So thank you for being here today. Dr. Stephen Rummage is our lecturer this morning, and then will be our chapel speaker as well as our leadership luncheon guest. Dr. Rummage is the senior pastor of Quail Strings Baptist Church in Oklahoma City, one of the largest and most influential churches in our Southern Baptist denomination. He's also pastored churches in Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, and Louisiana. He's the author of several books and the founder of Moving Forward, a radio teaching ministry, which Dr. Brian Kennedy indicated this morning he listens to and enjoys. So thank you for that encouragement, Brian. Um, he, Dr. Rummage holds the MDiv with a specialization in biblical languages from Southeastern Seminary and a PhD in preaching from New Orleans Seminary. And to his great regret, he did not graduate from Gateway Seminary yet. His wife, Michelle, is with him here today. He has a son, Joshua, who lives with his wife, Morgan, in Tampa, Florida. Would you join me in welcome for our lecture time today, Dr. Stephen Rummage. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wards, and what a joy it is for me to be here with you today at Gateway Seminary. This is my first time here with you, and so I am so thankful to God uh, for your work and how God is using this seminary and how God is working in your life. Uh, and it's a great, great honor to be able to be here to deliver uh, this lecture and then uh, a little bit later on to be able to preach God's Word in chapel services today. When I enrolled at seminary, I had just turned 22. And uh, I stepped on the campus of uh, Southeastern Seminary, where I did my MDiv, and the limits of my knowledge about anything that a seminary would teach, the limits of my knowledge as I stepped on that campus were astounding. I knew virtually nothing. I knew how to get to the library and to my classes, and beyond that, I didn't know much at all. I knew about as much about the Old and New Testaments as any kid who grew up in church might know. I didn't know anything about church history. I didn't know anything about systematic theology. I didn't know that systematic theology was a thing. I remember seeing systematic theology as a course that I could sign up for and wondering what that was. And so I, I knew so little. I'm not sure if I had ever heard the term expository preaching when I began as a seminary student, but I was about to learn. Because the first seminary course that I attended, first day of class, first thing in the morning, was a class called the Preparation of Sermons. Our professor walked in, he introduced himself, and as he introduced the class and himself and the semester, here's what he said. He said, I'm going to teach you how to preach expository sermons that come directly from the Bible. I'm going to teach you to preach in such a way so that you can preach with the Bible in your hand, I'm going to teach you to preach in a way so that you can preach, if you choose, without notes or with minimal notes. And he says, I'm going to teach you to preach in a way so that people will want to take notes on what you say. Well, I had never preached a sermon, not even a short sermon. I don't know whether I had ever heard a real expository sermon before I began that semester. But along the way, I learned more and more about expositional preaching. And I learned the developmental elements of preaching as you develop the sermon and as you put meat on the bones of your sermon outline. I learned about how to use explanation, illustration, argumentation, and application. To this day, when I construct a sermon, I measure it based on what I learned in that first seminary class that I took. 
And I learned basic principles such as every expository sermon needs explanation so that the listener can know and understand Bible concepts. Every expository sermon needs application so that listeners can trust and obey God's truth. And every expository sermon needs illustration so that listeners can imagine and visualize sermon concepts. My goal today is to talk to you about the value and use of illustration in expository preaching. So what is illustration in the sermon? There there are a variety of definitions or descriptions you could find about what illustration should be. One that I really like comes from Power in the Pulpit by Jerry Vines and Jim Shaddix. And there they compare illustrations to mental photographs that illumine the ideas of our messages. That, that's a great way to think about an illustration, and I'll talk more about that as I move along, but a, a mental photograph, a mental image that then illuminates ideas of our messages. More than one writer has said an illustration is like a window in the sermon. It throws light on the idea that you're presenting in your message. And so we could look at different descriptions of illustration, but I want to ask this question. Must expository preaching include illustration? I mean, do you have to have it in exposition? And and my answer to that question would be no. You could have only explanation and application of the text, and you would have expository preaching. When I'm teaching expository preaching, I usually tell my students, if there's no explanation, there's no expository. If there's no application, There's no preaching. So minimally, you have to have explanation and application. But if you only had explanation and application in the sermon, your message would become almost entirely propositional. One concept piled up on another. So you don't have to have illustration, but friend, you need to have illustration in the expository sermon. Charles Spurgeon described a sermon with no illustration as a house without windows. And he warned, a house must not have thick walls without openings. Neither must a discourse be all made up of solid slabs of doctrine without a window of comparison. If so, our hearers will gradually forsake us. That is a beautiful, genteel Victorian way of saying people are not going to pay attention to you if you don't have some illustrations in your sermon. And so the question is not, must expository preaching include illustration? The better question is, should expository expository preaching include illustration? And I would say, if you want your preaching to be memorable, engaging, interesting, and compelling, then the answer is yes. In his book, I Believe I'll Testify, by Cleophas LaRue identifies four levels of expectation among listeners as they hear the sermon. I love this. He starts with the first, and he moves down with lower and lower levels of expectation that people have as they listen. So four different levels of expectation as people are listening. The first level he calls high alert. That's usually what you have at the beginning, attentive listening in which the listeners are seeking to understand how the Word of God is speaking to them. And so people usually come in on high alert, but if you're not careful, that level of expectation can degenerate. He gives a second level. He calls it pearls without a string. And he says the preacher lacks coherence, but the listeners are still trying to retrieve pearls. They're trying to find standalone ideas that can offer some type of meaning and help. And then if they can't find pearls without a string, it moves to the next level, which he calls broken pieces. He says that's a last-ditch effort by listeners to find something, anything, spiritually helpful in the message, maybe even settling for, well, at least the preacher seemed friendly. (laughs) One time after I got done preaching, somebody shook my hand at the door, and she was a lady probably about 65 to 70 years old, and as she walked out, shook my hand, she said, Dr. Rummage, you are a snappy dresser. I thought that must have been a terrible sermon, because I'm not that snappy a dresser. But anyway, broken pieces. And then the fourth level, he calls clock watching. 
And he says this is the last level. When the clock is speaking louder than the preacher and listeners have given up hope that he will have anything meaningful to say. Now, one way to keep listeners away from clock watching and on high alert is to use illustrations skillfully. And to use them never losing sight of the goal that the purpose of the illustration is not just to engage and not just to entertain, but instead for the illustration to help the text to speak to our listeners. In using illustrations to preach with power, Brian Chappell says illustrations are a means, not an end. A sermon built on illustration, he says, rather than on solid biblical exposition, displays a dangerous shift of focus. And so illustration should never be the master of the expository sermon, but illustration can be a faithful and helpful servant of the expository sermon. Do it wrong, and illustration becomes a departure from biblical exposition. Do it right, and illustration does much, much more than just keep things interesting. Think with me just for a moment about a few of the values of illustration in the expository sermon. Illustrations command attention. They connect new concepts in your message to ideas your listeners already understand. They relax your listeners and can make them more receptive to what you're saying. They allow you to repeat the same truth in a message without being redundant. They vary the pace of the sermon and provide breaks in intensity. They customize the message to your listeners. They help people remember ideas from your message. When illustration does these things, it's not a departure from Bible exposition. Instead, effective illustration enhances biblical exposition. And with those things in mind, I want to talk to you about some ways to make illustrations stronger in expository preaching. That's the rest of my lecture. I want to talk to you about some ways to strengthen your illustrations. And I framed each of these ways to strengthen your illustrations as greater than statements. And so I'm going to give you 10 greater than statements to help you think about uh, strengthening illustration in expositional preaching or expositional teaching of the Word of God. Here's the first statement. Essential is greater than ornamental. Essential is greater than ornamental. By that I mean illustrations essentially connected to a biblical concept are better than illustrations that you only include to decorate your sermon. If it's only there to add humor or beauty or emotion to your message, it's not an effective illustration. One homiletician said that illustrations should be like blossoms that grow from the branches of a tree, not like what he called brightly colored kites that get stuck in the limbs of the tree. If you were walking past a tree and you saw that it was full of all these brightly colored kites, that might get your attention, but you would be able to tell those kites don't belong in that tree. That image has always stuck with me. Ornamental illustrations are like kites stuck in the tree. Their only purpose is to relieve the dullness of an otherwise boring message. I call that kind of illustration throwing out candy to the kids. I'm just going to give the kids some candy to sort of, you know, keep them on board for a while. That's not what illustration should do. That type of illustration may pacify the listeners, but it doesn't serve the exposition. So how do you make sure that the illustration that you're using is connected to the biblical idea you're presenting? In an old preaching book called The Power of Illustration, John Dowling gives some helpful steps for discovering illustrations. The first step he gave is cultivate your habits of observation. As a preacher of God's Word, keep your eyes and your ears open for things that will help you to illustrate. It's amazing how many things you can see when your eyes are open and when you're thinking expositionally and homiletically. So cultivate your habits of observation. Secondly, he said, read widely. All kinds of reading. News, science, music, art, fiction, history, biography. All of those things can help you find material for illustrations, especially if you learn to think that way. If you're reading, thinking about, okay, where can I connect what I'm learning here, what I'm reading here, this person's story. 
How can I connect this to biblical truth? A third thing that he said, teach yourself to see analogies. Many of the best illustrations are comparisons and analogies. And learning to see them is like exercising a muscle in your imagination. In fact, in his book, Preaching with Purpose, Jay Adams suggested something to do just to develop your powers of finding analogies. He said, sit in a room, whether it's your study or your kitchen or anywhere, just sit in a room and begin to look at the things in that room and start thinking about how you can use the things in that room, whether it's your book bag or the light switch or a doorknob or a coffee cup or a picture in a frame, how you can use those things as analogies for biblical truth. It's a helpful exercise, and it might amaze you that just sitting in a room and looking at the things around you, you may be able to find all the illustrations you need for what you're getting ready to preach just for being in that room. The key is starting with the biblical concept from your preaching text and then moving outward from there to your illustration so that the illustration really flowers from the truth of the Scripture and then learning to look for sermon illustrations everywhere. Essential is greater than ornamental. A second greater than statement. Images are greater than only stories. Thinking of illustrations in terms of images rather than always thinking of illustrations as stories or anecdotes will help you as you develop in using illustration. Now, an anecdote is a story, usually a short story with a point. And it's often what we think of when we say or when we hear illustration. If I say illustration, most people will think story. He's going to tell a story. He's talking about telling stories. But speaking more broadly, an illustration is not just a story. An illustration is an image. An illustration is a picture. If you buy an illustrated children's book, that means it has pictures in it. A sermon illustration can be a short story or an anecdote, but it could also be a vivid image. Jesus once illustrated God's kingdom by saying in Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. That's not a story. That's just one sentence. But it is a series of images, a precious pearl, a merchant selling everything that he has and then buying it. It's an illustration with an image. It draws a picture. Many times, stories are the best illustrations to use. There's power in narrative. There's power in story. But every point of your message doesn't necessarily call for a story. And in fact, I would argue if you're preaching from a biblical narrative, then adding too many other stories will begin to distract from the central story of that biblical narrative. So you don't always need a lot of stories. You do need images throughout your message to help the listener see the truth of your text. When you begin to think of illustration as image, a wider variety of illustrations will come to your mind, including images from object lessons or works of art or video clips. Please use these sparingly. Let me say that one more time. Please use these sparingly if you're using video clips. Brief analogies and other non-story illustrations. Before I move on, please use video clips sparingly. And by sparingly, I mean not at all. Okay, keep on, keep on. Amen. But it, it's, I, and I, 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 here's what I think. I think that a video image you put up on screen is usually not going to stay with your listener as long as, as long as an image that you help draw in their own mind. Because when you put it up on the screen, everything's there. When you're drawing the picture and they're recreating it in their mind, it stays with them longer because it's their image. Think of illustrations as image rather than always thinking of them as stories. A third greater than statement. On target is better than almost on target. An illustration that is right on target with the biblical truth you're presenting is better than one that's almost on target. Now that statement may seem obvious, but this gets really tricky in real life sermon preparation because here's what happens. Let's say you're preaching a sermon that week from John 3 
where Jesus told Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And as you're preparing, you come across an incredibly effective illustration. Maybe it's a story from the news about a house that caught on fire and a little girl was trapped inside on the second floor and a fireman rushes into the house and moves through the heat and the smoke and the flames, goes into the little girl's room, picks her up, shields her with his arms as he carries her out of the house to safety and saves her life. And you read that or you see that and you think, wow, I've got the perfect illustration. I'm going to talk about how being born again is like that little girl being rescued. I mean, it's dramatic it's current. It's got a firefighter and a little girl in it, for Pete's sake. I mean, this seems like a great illustration. Wrong. Because in this text, Jesus isn't talking about being rescued. That's not the image he's using. He's talking about new birth. And so the illustration has to match the truth. You need birth imagery there, not rescue imagery. And in fact, if our illustration is not on target, but almost on target, it will actually distract people from the truth. It can confuse people about the truth that you're talking about. Imagine a child's learning how to read, and she's got a little reading book with pictures to help her understand the words. And in her book, the words say, the dog played with the red ball, but the picture on the page shows a dog chewing a bone. Well, that illustration is going to confuse that little girl. Because it doesn't match the text. Your illustration needs to match the biblical concept you're talking about, or else you'll distract your listener from what the text is saying. And so on target is better than almost on target. Number four, shorter is better than longer. Shorter illustrations are better than longer illustrations. One of the superpowers of illustration is its ability to communicate ideas quickly. In How to Prepare Bible Messages, James Braga said this, an illustration should not be so lengthy that it robs the message of its importance. Be careful not to have overlong illustrations. And we can learn a lot about the power of short illustrations from the way that Jesus told His parables. And so if you just want to look with me, look in Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15, I, I love this chapter of the Word of God, and it's, it's a beautiful passage to preach from. It's also very illustrative of how to use illustration. And I recognize that the, the parables of Jesus don't function exactly the same way as our illustrations do, but I think there's something instructive for us in this. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables to illustrate God's joy in saving the lost. The first parable is the lost sheep. I would call that parable a brief analogy. A shepherd with a hundred sheep leaves the 99 in the open country to find the one that is lost. He carries that sheep back home and then invites his neighbors to rejoice with him. Just a brief analogy. There are two characters, the shepherd and the sheep. There's a simple plot, but a brief analogy. And then the second parable in this chapter is the parable of the lost coin. And it's shorter than the lost sheep story. Really, it's more of an image than it is a full illustration. A woman loses one of ten silver coins. She looks all over the house for it. She finds it. She invites her friends to rejoice with her. Just a really short image. And then the third parable is a full-blown story. The story of the lost son. It has three characters. Father, the older brother, the prodigal. It has a plot with twists and turns, things that surprise you. The prodigal demands his inheritance. The father divides the property between his two sons. The prodigal goes and lives recklessly in the far country. He loses everything. He has a job feeding pigs. He decides to go back home. He rehearses what he's going to say. He begins to make his way back home. The father sees him coming, runs to him, shows all this joy in the prodigal returning. He throws a big party for his son, and then the older brother gets mad. Now, those three parables all of which illustrate the same basic spiritual truth, are good indicators of the lengths of illustrations that we can use in our sermons. You can use the descriptive image, like the lost coin. You can use a brief analogy or example, like the lost sheep. Or you can tell a longer story, like the prodigal son. But here's something to notice. Even the longest of those stories 
is still fairly short. You can read the parable of the prodigal son out loud at a pretty slow rate, and it will take you two minutes and 45 seconds to read it. And by the way, that is Jesus' longest parable. So the best illustrations that you use are not long, shaggy dog stories that meander and take up the majority of time in your sermon. The best illustrations engage the imagination and draw a picture of Bible truth you're presenting with simple, well-planned economy. So shorter is greater than longer. And having said that, before I move on to my next point, in the next hour when I preach, do not time any of the illustrations that I use. (laughs) Number five, specific is greater than general. Specific is greater than general. It's better to be specific in the way you tell your illustrations. Just a few well-chosen details and specifics begin to draw a picture in the mind of your listener. Your listener's mind rejects generalities, but is attracted to specifics like iron to a magnet. Think about the specifics in the three parables of Jesus we just discussed. In the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus gives the specific detail that when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Did Jesus have to give that detail for the illustration to work? Not necessarily, but man, that picture of him putting it on his shoulders, carrying that sheep home, I love that detail because it shows me the sheep is responsible for wandering away, but the shepherd alone bears the responsibility of bringing the sheep back. The shepherd doesn't hand the sheep a map And say, here you go, buddy. Find your way home. Sheep don't know how to follow maps. The shepherd doesn't say, lost sheep, let me give you three alliterated principles to keep you from getting lost in the the future. Sheep don't know how to take notes on sermons. Instead, the shepherd lays the sheep on his shoulders and takes it home. It's a beautiful picture of God's care and provision. In the parable of the lost coin, Jesus gives us details that the woman lit a lamp and swept the house until she found it. In the parable of the prodigal, the father called his once wayward son to be given the best robe and a ring on his hand and shoes for his feet. Details. And then Jesus also in in the parable of the prodigal uses direct dialogue and brings us into conversation between the father and his sons. Those details help you see what's happening. And so specific is better than general. Now that doesn't mean using fancy flowery language in your illustration. It doesn't mean making the description really precious and and flowery and ornate. Spurgeon said, very beautiful sermons are generally very useless ones. To aim at elegance, he said, failure. When When I talk about being specific, what I'm talking about is including details and dialogue and 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 a dramatic structure in your illustration in order to engage the imagination. So say I slid into my powder blue Chevy Monte Carlo instead of saying I got into my vehicle. Or say she looked at him through tears and said, sometimes I wonder if you love me anymore, rather than just saying she questioned his love. Many times when preachers use illustrations, they merely allude to something rather than telling it. And that can happen with all kinds of illustrations, but before I move on to my next Uh, principle, I I want to say this happens especially, I think, when we're using biblical illustrations. A lot of times we think we're using a biblical illustration when in fact we're just alluding to a biblical story. If you want the illustration to be an illustration, tell the biblical story. Saying it's like Joseph forgiving his brothers in Genesis is not an illustration. It's an allusion to the Old Testament but you need to tell the story. Just a few strategic details can make illustrations come alive in the listener's imagination. Specific is greater than general. Number six, relatable is greater than fantastic. Illustrations that relate to things your listeners already understand are better than fantastic illustrations outside of your listener's realm of experience. Think about the types of things that Jesus used for materials in his parables. He talked about farming and plants and family and cooking 
and buying and selling things and building houses and fishing and getting married and having kids. He talked about things that his listeners could connect with. And the beautiful thing is they still connect with listeners today. One of the things I found in preaching in a cross-cultural setting that is really helpful is to make sure you use illustrations that are just familiar to human experience. If you start using illustrations that may be really incredible stories, but that are really tied to a culture or a place or a time, they tend not to connect as well. One value of illustrations is that they help the listener understand the unknown by connecting with something that's already familiar to the listener. In one of his evangelistic sermons, Charles Spurgeon told about traveling on a boat from Cookshaven, Germany, to a small island on the North Sea. When the boat was out at sea, far away from the sight of land, Spurgeon began to notice these huge swarms of butterflies. And he began to wonder why those butterflies could possibly be flying so far out over the deep sea. As the boat came closer to land, Spurgeon noticed on almost every wave that washed on the shore, large quantities of poor, dead, drowned butterflies. And he tells that story, and then at the end he says this, Do you know those butterflies are just like some of you? And then he confronted people who insisted on understanding certain difficult doctrines and having all these questions answered before they would trust Jesus as Savior. He said, you have no business or no more business there than a butterfly has out at sea. It will drown you. He said, come to Jesus. If you must have the knots untied, try to untie them after you get saved. But now your first business is with Jesus. I love that illustration. For one thing, it's almost impossible to tell at the beginning of that illustration where, where Spurgeon's going with it. And that's, that's a good part of an illustration. If, if the listener is a little bit, they know you're going somewhere with it, but there's a little bit of a mystery about where it's going. I, I like that about it. But then I love the fact that it's right on target with what he's talking about. And I love the fact that even now, over 100 years later, the idea of being on a boat and seeing these large swarms of butterflies is easy for me, and I would hope for you as well, to visualize and understand. And it's right on truth, with, right on point with what he was preaching. Don't let hypothetical questions keep you from coming to Jesus. So think about who your listeners are. Think about what their frame of reference is. Think about what they're familiar with. And then use illustrations that connect. Here's a good rule of thumb. If I have to explain an illustration extensively, whether it's from sports or history or science or the Bible or even my own life, if I have to explain it extensively, it's not the illustration to use. Illustrations that are relatable are better than ones that are fantastic. Number seven, truthful is greater than untruthful. Truthful is greater than untruthful. In John 14, verse 17, Jesus calls the indwelling Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. If the preacher is seeking to be used by the Holy Spirit, but at the same time playing fast and loose with the truth, then that preacher is working at cross purposes with God. And if the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he is because Jesus says he is, then a preacher who is deliberately misleading from the pulpit is not anointed or filled by or blessed by or controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Tell the truth. Now that doesn't mean that every illustration you tell has to be a true illustration. You can use fictional stories. You can use made-up analogies in your sermon. Just be truthful about it. If an illustration is fictional, Give the listener a signal to know that it's fictional. Say, imagine this, or suppose this, or say this isn't true, but tell the story. And then you've told them that what you're getting ready to use is a, a fictional story. So it doesn't mean you always have to tell true stories. It does mean you need to tell the truth about fictional stories that you tell. Make sure they know they're fictional. Truthfulness also means this. Don't steal material. 
That doesn't mean you can't use someone else's material. It does mean you should give credit. And it doesn't mean you have to give a full bibliographical citation as you preach your sermon. You can just say, Tony Evans told this story, and tell the story. In your notes somewhere, you need to have all the documentation. But as you're preaching it, simply give simple credit. Truthfulness also means this. When you tell a factual story, check the facts. Make sure you get things right. It undermines your credibility if you tell a story without having the facts. And let me add a PS here. You have fact checkers in your congregation. And they are Googling you as you preach your message. And they're checking on that illustration and they will find you out. I was telling an illustration one time about a man who I grew up with, a man in our community I grew up knowing. Knowing. And I was just telling this story about him. I told his name in the, story, in the illustration. After it was over, a lady in my church, wonderful lady, she's my friend, she came up to me afterwards. She said, I looked him up while you were talking about him. I found his obituary. And she said, and she told me like five other things about him, but then she also confirmed everything I said about him was true. And this is somebody I grew up, grew up knowing. And so it's just, it's just true. People are checking. With the resources available to us, it's inexcusable not to check and verify a story. Truthful is better than untruthful. Most significantly, don't knowingly tell a story that is not true as though it were true. And don't tell somebody else's story as though it were your story. That's dishonesty, and it has no place among God's people. Truthful is infinitely greater than untruthful. Number eight, transparency is greater than making it all about you. And I'm talking about illustration here. Illustration is one of the places where if we're not careful, we can make the sermon too much about us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul wrote, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Proclaiming Christ, not promoting Himself, was Paul's priority. Now we know that in Paul's preaching in Acts and in his writing in the epistles, he shared his testimony. He talked about his experiences. He talked about his life. And there's value in sharing some things about your life and your thoughts and your struggles and your walk with God and your family, always with their permission. And if you talk about your wife from the pulpit, she always needs to be the hero of that story Amen. But there's value in that type of self-disclosure from the pulpit. Personal illustrations can generate interest because your listeners care about you. You'll tell personal illustrations better than other illustrations because you were there when it happened. And also personal illustrations have the, the added value of being usually new for the people to hear. And so there's, there's some interest there. So there's plenty to commend personal disclosure from the pulpit. But here are some cautions. It's good to be vulnerable as you preach. But if you're sharing a spiritual struggle in your life, don't paint yourself in such a negative light that it overpowers your ability to minister God's truth to your people. For example, don't say, last night I was yelling at my wife and kids because my anger was just out of control. It's usually unwise to share a struggle it's too fresh, too graphically personal, or unresolved. And then also be cautious about illustrations that always paint you as the hero of every situation. As the person who always knows the answer, as the person who always solves the problem, as the person who always leads the person to Jesus Christ, or on the other hand, as the person who's always the innocent victim of someone else's mistreatment. Be cautious about illustrations that portray you as the hero or the victim. In Preaching by the Book, Scott Pace says, if we regularly use our personal stories of faithfulness as an example, it can easily be misinterpreted as shameless self-promotion or bragging. And I would agree with him, but then I would add a caveat. Sometimes it is not misinterpreted as shameless self-promotion or bragging. Sometimes that's exactly what it is. 
Now, I'll share with you an, uh, an example of a guy who I just, I thought he did this so well and so beautifully that, uh, that I wanted to share this with you. Not long ago, I heard uh, evangelism professor at Southwestern, Matt Queen, begin a sermon on evangelism by saying this. He said, I'm going to share a number of stories today about my own experiences sharing the gospel. And then he said, you need to know, in every one of these examples, the person I shared with did not trust Jesus Christ as Savior. He sort of started that way. In other words, he was saying, I am not going to be the evangelism hero of all these stories. And that was refreshing and encouraging to me and to our people. His point was, you've got to keep sharing the gospel faithfully no matter what the response. And so, being personal, self-disclosing is greater than making it all about you. One other caution before I move on to the next one. Don't use too many illustrations about yourself in one sermon. One of the things I like to do is sometimes just back up and look at the whole sermon as, uh, as one piece and ask, okay, how much of me is in here? How many stories did I tell about me? One, I think, is great. Two is probably enough. Three or more personal illustrations where they're really about you is probably too many. And one of the things, I, I did an extensive study in, in, prep, in, in prepping for these lectures. I, I did an extensive study of the way Charles Spurgeon used illustration. And uh, I looked at a number of his sermons and just, just looked at all the different ways he used illustration. One of the things that I noticed was, first of all, Spurgeon used analogies and images much, much more than he used anecdotes. He rarely used an anecdote. He used a lot of analogies and images. And then the other thing I noticed was he would use... Uh, he, he would include himself in the illustration sometimes, and that created a connection because it was personal, but the illustration wasn't really about him. Like the illustration I shared with you earlier about those butterflies, that really wasn't about him. It was his observation. He was there. He was on the boat. He saw all those things happen, but it wasn't really about him. And so I, I think that's a, a place where there's some wisdom to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to include some things that have happened to me, but even in doing that, it's not all going to be about me. Number nine, natural humor is greater than jokes. Using natural humor in the sermon is better than telling jokes. Every time I hear a preacher start an illustration by saying, there was a guy who bought a parrot, or something like that, I prepare for the worst, and the result is always worse than what I'm prepared for. I love jokes. I'll tell you this. I love jokes. I've got three good parrot jokes I could tell you right now. I love jokes. But I agree with Herschel York when he says, leave the jokes to the comedians. Jokes are risky. And by, by the way, I'll, I'll be careful in telling you, I don't think it demeans the pulpit to use humor. Here, here's another quote from Spurgeon. Spurgeon said one time, he said, I'm often criticized for the amount of humor I use from the pulpit. He said, if people knew how much humor I suppress, they would congratulate me more than criticize me. I don't think it demeans the pulpit to use humor. It's, it's just part of talking. We, we usually use humor in our speech and the way we talk. The reason I don't like jokes, one reason is jokes are risky. Jokes are risky for a lot of reasons. They completely depend on getting a laugh. That's what a joke is for. It's not primarily illustrative. The main purpose of a joke is for people to laugh. And there are so many ways you can mess it up. If you step over the punchline, if your timing is off, if you leave out some essential detail, if you mess up the sequence, you've ruined the joke. Jokes are risky. Most significantly, jokes usually don't illustrate that well. They're rarely right on point with the truth you're trying to communicate. And then I'll just tell you, this, this isn't in my notes, but I'll, I'll share this. Another reason I think jokes are so risky is there are different versions of jokes that are out there. I mean, the same joke, and you don't know that the version you tell is the version that people might know. Here's what I mean by that. My, my dad is a barber. He grew up or I grew up in a home where my dad heard jokes from people all day because people tell their barbers jokes. 
My dad has a, a strict policy. He really does. Uh, he doesn't tell any off-color jokes. He doesn't allow anybody in his shop to tell off-color jokes. I said, Dad, what do you do if one of your customers tells a joke that's off-color? He said, I don't respond at all. And he said, that's the last time they'll tell me a joke like that. He just, he just learned to do that. But when I was growing up, my dad might hear a joke that wasn't way off color, but, but wouldn't have been appropriate for the pulpit and he, or, or for his son to hear around the dinner table. And he would come in and he'd just clean up these jokes for me. He'd tell these jokes to me and he'd clean them up. And so I knew all these jokes that my dad had cleaned up for me. And I'd get in the pulpit and I'd tell these jokes. <laughs> And people would come, usually men come up to me after the service and say, Pastor, you know, there's another version of that joke. <laughs> That's another risk of telling jokes. Instead of jokes, use natural humor as you preach. Be willing to laugh at yourself. Be willing to laugh at your own weaknesses. Find the humor in the world around you, but don't tell jokes. And before I move on any further... Don't tell jokes. Number 10, connecting the dots is greater than leaving people guessing. At the end of any illustration, you need to help the listener connect the image you presented or the story you've told back to the biblical concept of your sermon. Don't assume your listeners get it. You have to connect the dots for them or else they may not see how your illustration relates to the biblical truth. And so there needs to be something at the end of any, any illustration that brings the listener back to what the text is saying. I call this the in the same way part of the illustration. There needs to be an in the same way statement at the end of any illustration you use. Now, I don't always actually say in the same way, but I'm thinking it. There's that connection sentence. And it, it's sort of like, even though I've said don't tell jokes, it's sort of like the punchline of the illustration. At the end of that illustration, there needs to be a sentence that takes the listener from that analogous truth or that image back to the truth from the text. Connecting the illustration back to the textual truth helps you move into the application of the biblical truth you're presenting. Remember, the illustration's the servant in the sermon. The illustration serves the explanation and it helps people to see things and it also serves the application by showing the connection between the truth and the application of the truth. In preaching for the rest of us, Robbie Gallaty and Stephen Smith say this, the end of the illustration is the best pivotal moment for application. The last line of the illustration should be the first line of the application. I love that. That's that in the same way statement. I've just given them the analogy or the example or the image or the, or the story, and then I take it back to the truth. For example, in the message I preached from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, I talk about the priority of proclaiming the gospel. You know, Paul says, I, I delivered to you as of first importance, what was also delivered to me. And he talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm talking about the priority of proclaiming the gospel. And I use this illustration. I say, uh, you know, not too long ago, Michelle and I noticed some bear patches in the grass in our backyard. And so we went to Lowe's or Home Depot or somewhere. We bought some grass seed and we came home. And I went out in the backyard and I, I sowed that seed. And I don't know how grass seed works. A botanist could explain it. A horticulturist could explain it. I don't know how it sinks into the ground and germinates and then sprouts. I don't understand all that. I just know this. When I sow the seed, something comes up. It's just that simple. But I want you to imagine something. Imagine that we went to Lowe's or Home Depot or somewhere and we bought that grass seed. And uh, we came home. And I put the grass seed in the garage. And after a couple of days, Michelle noticed that I hadn't sown that seed. And then after a week, she, she noticed I still hadn't sown that seed. And after two weeks, she noticed I still hadn't sown that seed. And, and she came to me and said, Stephen, are you, are you going to sow that seed? We bought that grass seed to 
to, for those bare patches. I said, well, I'm going to sow it, but right now I'm just studying the seed. And she said, what? I said, well, right now I'm, I'm just studying the seed. I, I've, I've got the bag open, and I go out in the garage sometimes, and I just get a handful of that seed, and I look at it, and I consider the, the miracle and the power and the value of that seed, and I meditate on how powerful that seed is. In fact, I've gotten in a group with four or five other guys, and we're in a text group, and we just talk to one another about how, how powerful the seed is and how wonderful the seed is. And, and so eventually I'm going to get around to sowing the seed, but right now I'm just meditating on the seed and enjoying the seed myself. Let me ask you this question. You think that would go over with my wife if I told her I did that with that seed? Absolutely not, because the seed is not meant primarily to be studied and contemplated. The seed is meant to be sown. Now, it's wonderful to celebrate the gospel. And it's wonderful to meditate on the gospel. And it's wonderful to study it and consider all of its implications in our lives. But the primary reason that God has given us the message of Jesus Christ and His death and His burial and His resurrection is that that message is to be sown. It's to be shared. Because it's at the point that we share it that the gospel operates in its fullest power. Okay, so I, I took that... By the way, that's the end of the illustration. So I, I, took, I, I took the image, and I, I teased it out a little bit, and I, I talked about the positive and, and negative side. And by the way, any analogy you can approach from either a positive or negative side as you're relating it to the truth. And so I, I did that with it. But then at the end, you've got to come back and take it to the truth that you're talking about. From the text, don't leave your listener guessing. There has to be that connection sentence as you move from the illustration into the application of the message. When you move from analogy to application, it hits hard because usually in hearing the illustration, the listener has lowered his or her defenses. And because, you know, because a lot of times when we're, when we're illustrating, we, we sort of move out of preaching mode and we're in imaginary mode or we're in storytelling mode and, and, and we back up. And you'll see it even, you can see it physically in your people. When you start to tell a story, people usually will, if their arms have been crossed, they may uncross their arms. That guy that sits in church and he's looking out the window like this the whole time, I don't know why he's there, but there he is. You start telling that story, he, he looks at you. So usually people lower their defenses because they feel like, well, he's telling this story right now, it, and it, it engages them. As you move from analogy to application, the truth hits harder because the listener has usually lowered his defenses. Spurgeon said it this way, I always tickle my oyster to get it to open up. Then I stab it with my knife. <laughs> Connecting the dots is better than leaving your listener guessing. Well, those are just 10 things that I found help to make illustration stronger in expository preaching. Steve Brown, a great preacher, a great teacher of preaching, a great illustrator, great storyteller, he said something one time that I wrestled with. He was writing in the book, Handbook of Contemporary Preaching. He wrote a, a chapter on illustration. And he said this, Steve Brown said, if you can't illustrate it, don't preach it. And I thought to myself, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't have to have an illustration for every point. What if I just can't find a good illustration? Does that mean I shouldn't preach this truth if I can't find an illustration? That's not what he meant. He didn't mean that every point has to have an illustration. My preaching professor, Wayne McDill, people would ask him, does every point need an illustration? He would say, no, only the ones you want people to remember. But every point doesn't have to have an illustration. Steve Brown wasn't saying that God cannot use the preaching of His Word without our illustrations. We know that. God's Word works regardless of whether we use illustrations. But here's what he meant when he said, if you can't illustrate it, don't preach it. Don't preach it. Here's what he was saying. 
He was saying, if the preacher can't find some example, some expression, some analogy of how this truth from God's Word works in real life, then the preacher probably isn't ready to preach that truth. Because when you understand something, I mean, when you really understand it, when you know how it applies, then you can usually give an example of it. You can usually find an analogy of it. Effective illustration draws a picture of the truth you're proclaiming from God's Word. It doesn't distract from the truth. It doesn't just entertain or amuse the listener. Instead, effective illustration helps the listener understand and then trust and obey the Bible truths that we're presenting as we preach. Thank you so much. All right, that was absolutely fantastic. And those of us who teach preaching no longer need to deliver that lecture. We just need to assign this presentation, watch the video, and you're good. Before we go, I, if I could, I'd like to just add two comments to what was said. I, I, I affirm everything that was said. I want to make two additions of what was said. Maybe I zoned out and Stephen said these things, but in my notes, I want to add these two thoughts. First of all, when he was talking about using your family as an illustration, those were great insights. I would add this one. Never use your family without asking their permission to use them. And here's what I learned over the years. When my children were very small and I would ask them, you know what they always said? Yes. But when they moved into puberty years and into teenage years, the answer was always no. They did not want me to talk about them in front of people. And actually, you'll find in my books stories of my children, and every one of those books I sent the chapter and said, do I have your permission to put this in the book before I send it out? And now they're adults, and they were willing to say yes again to some of those stories. Listen, I'll take that a step further. Most of you don't notice this because I don't do it, but do you notice that my grandchildren are never in my social media feeds? My grandchildren are not public figures. I do not have the right to put their pictures out for people to see for my own personal uh, attention or, or, or uh, uh, popularity. And so I don't think you should be using your family in any media for illustrative purposes without their specific permission. Uh, not everyone wants a public life and wants their business out in front of people. Be careful about that. And the second thing I would say is about the use of humor. Another reason that you should be careful about it is because humor many times has to offend someone in order to be funny. And you need to be careful about that. And I'll give you just one example. I was in a very exclusive hotel in Houston, Texas, speaking at an event arranged by one of our trustees in which I was presenting the seminary and asking for new people to become donors of Gateway Seminary. The person introducing me in Houston, Texas, got up and made a long, long introduction emphasizing how I was from Texas. And I stepped up in front of all these Texas and Texans and said, well, thank you for that introduction, and it is true, I am from Texas, but I got over it. You think it's, you think it's quiet in this room right now? It went stone cold, dead silent. And in the next nanoseconds, this is what went through my mind. Well, Jeff, you're dying here. And these people aren't going to give you enough money to even cover the cost of this dinner. And so, God, I'm going to tell a little lie right now, and you're going to have to forgive me later. But then I said, oh, you know, I'm just kidding. No one ever gets over Texas. And everyone roared with laughter, and I went on with my speech. But that was a good reminder of me that when you make a humorous joke and someone gets made fun of, you're going to lose every time. So when you're making fun of an ethnic group or a person, a group with disabilities or a group of people who have a particular perspective, you can be sure someone from that group is sitting in your audience that morning. Be careful about humor, because, about joke telling, 
because it can be so easily lead to offense. Stephen, thank you for a fantastic lecture, thoroughly prepared, well delivered. We ex we're excited about seeing you model this for us now as we come back in a few minutes. So let's take a break, restrooms, other things. Come up and visit with Dr. Rummage for a minute, and we'll start at 11 o'clock with chapel.